Pretty interesting stuff, as you said. To call a re-raise on the flop with just ace queen. Pretty good stuff by the jungle man there. I'm gonna give him a ring. He's actually in Georgia right now. I'm in Italy, so we're similar time zone. I figured he'd be easy to track down. Hello? Hey, what's up, Daniel? Hi, uh, uh, give me two seconds. All right, no worries. Daniel was nice enough to take a break. He's playing uh, some online poker now, so he, he sat out of the games to, to jump on the call here. Thanks for that. No problem. Uh, what? Actually, can you give me, um, can you give me uh, five minutes, actually? <laughs> yeah. Uh, to sit out on my uh, blinds or whatever. Yeah, sure. What are you playing? I'm playing um, a mixed game and a, a limit 08 table. I mean, the limit 08 is just for fun, but I might be a favorite. I mean, it's, there's a fish in it. so That's good. Another fish besides <laughs> you is important. <laughs> yeah. All right, just throw your video on when you get back. So um, when, you, when you jump on Skype. Hey guys, it's Alex Rally, and welcome to a special episode of the Hand of the Day. I know in the past couple months you've seen some awesome, epic hands that I've played and other ones that I've shared from other great players around the world, but today I'm going to do something special for you guys. In addition to sharing my insights with you, I wanted to have a conversation with one of the best players in the world who I'm going to bring on the show with you today for a moment and give you a little bit of insight into the types of preparations that I like to do before big matches that I have coming up. In a couple weeks, I'll be heading to Poker Night in America at the beginning of April in Pittsburgh. And one of the things I like to do always to prepare for a great poker game, a big game, is to talk to colleagues and friends of mine about hands that we played in the past to dissect them and really get my brain working to think about all the advanced concepts in poker. So I'm gonna let you in into a bit of an insight into the conversations that I have with Daniel Jungleman Cates. I know you guys in the past have seen a hand that him and I played, uh, the one where we had an awesome battle of the pre-flop re-raising going on here. Uh, this hand comes from the exact same session of that same hand. So I chose one where we had played together in the same session. You could get a little bit of an insight into how the game was going on and a lot of good players in this game as well. So some fun stuff. It's Kachalab who's opened this pot up. Look at oh, this. Jungle Man did not raise with the ace queen of spades here. He just flatted here. So again, we've got four-way action. Yeah, so I wanted to cover this hand with you for the show. First of all, thanks for coming on. But I know we played in this cash game together, like, I don't know, four years ago now. And um, I did a hand of the day for my show with, with you where we had a fun altercation pre-flop, and I figured it'd be cool to do a give you a chance to shine in the show. So um, can you talk us through this hand a little bit? Like, what... What are their considerations pre-flop here in the small blind? You got catch a lob that opens, a good player opens early position, a trick it that calls. What are you thinking about in the small blind when it's uh, when it's on you? Well, I play tighter pre-flop in general, uh, and my post-flop range is a bit more structured, I guess. Uh, uh, things like that, mostly. I like more clear idea of like what hands I'm gonna. Uh, also, a lot basically pre-flop completely has changed and. Uh, post flop has changed uh, a little bit in the ways that I set. I could have squeezed here. I don't remember what position he opened in. Yeah, I mean, I'm always in sometimes. But in this case, I, I just thought it's obviously good enough to call it. Or calling is usually an okay option. Uh, it might not be the best necessarily, but in this case, I thought it was. Cool. Uh, at, at the time, for sure, obviously, because I did it. Uh, it kind of sucks if you get four bet, though. That's the only thing. Yeah, for sure, especially out of position against a good player like Kachalov, who's presumably not opening that loose early position in a cash game. Yeah. So what's up with the flop? We flop two overs, we're out of position, there's four players in the hand. Walk me through some of your leading thoughts here and why you decided to lead on this flop. Uh, you know what? In, in, currently, I, if I let it, I'd pick like a very small size. Um... And, you know, four-way, yeah, you kind of have to lead a bit. I, I might, I don't really like leading a swap in general, especially three-way, but four-way, yeah, I might just lead. 
Um, but also, if you notice, a backdoor flush draw too. Absolutely. So even if I don't have the best hand, I have a lot of backdoor equity and whatever. Um, it does look like I never really have anything big though. But on the same, at the same time, no one with the big blind really has anything big. Uh, they have it about as much as me, really. Uh, if actually, I could have some fives. People could think. I mean, I could overcall their, their somewhat wide. I guess. I guess it's okay. Um, but uh, I have I have more fives in my range than everyone except for the big blind. I could guess. Yeah. And it's probably not that far apart from the big blind. Excuse me, it's Jungle Man. Wow, Jungle Man. He's leading out queen. here. And look at that, Ignat throwing the best hand away. Wow, pretty amazing play there by the Jungle Man. He didn't raise before the flop, and all of a sudden he's leading out in bed. Now, Sam Trickett's thinking to himself, what hands would he lead out into four players with him? Well, Sam's not going to put him on a big pair because he would have raised before the flop. He might put him on a little pair, meaning he might think he can take the pot away from him. And also, how often would Jungle Man bet from this spot with a five in your mind, Mike? Well, how often would he call a raise with a with, with a five? And look at this. It went fold, fold, and Tricket re-raised you on the flop. So you bet something like 800, and he made it, I think, 3K. It's a little bit hard to tell with the sizing here, but you bet he raised. Okay. Yeah, I'm not folding. Sam Tricket. Just puts him on a small pair and thinks he can bet him out of this pot. And Jungle Man knows that Sam could have any two cards before the flop, including a five, but he's made the call. Mike, here. these guys are on another level here. This is 1250 bet, and Trick It now, who's made it about 4,000, <laughs> gets called on the, on the flop. These guys are both bluffing. I mean, Cates has called him, thinking the ace-queen high could be good here. That's how strong that is. And it is good. And he I, raised on the cutoff. He was in position caller pre-flop, and he oh. raised you on the flop with pretty much no equity. I mean, he has king-jack of hearts here, but... Yeah, uh, just, you know, folding's insane, basically. Uh, um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have backdoor spades, which happen. You know, that happens, like, what, like a fifth of the time. Yep. Uh, I, I see another spade on the turn. Uh, he probably doesn't have anything a lot of the time, especially if he cold-called or opened from either... Uh, he co you said he cold-called on the, on the cutoff, right? Yeah. Catch a love open, he calls the cutoff, and... Yeah, uh, yeah and the, when he cold-calls, if he opened on the cutoff, maybe he could have some fives. When he cold-calls, he really can't have that many. Right. Uh, so he's just so unlikely to have something. And if I lead, I can't fold to like his raise really here. Um, Another uh, interesting thing is <clears throat> you're kind of representing something like an overpair on the flop when you lead, and you you mentioned something about your range sort of being likely capped at overpairs, and so maybe he's trying to represent a five, knowing that it's really unlikely that you have a five. Well, in small blind, when I overcall, I probably have less fives than usual because the small blind's a really shitty position, and I can't like properly play like. Like something in five through shooter, like you know, I could see like an argument for someone saying you could overcall that button, but in the small blind, there's just no way. Uh, so I should have less fives, but still, neither of us has really has fives. But you could, you know, if I really wanted to have some lead range here, I should bet small, and I should have some over pairs for sure. I should have some sevens, maybe even. Uh, it would look sort of like if I wanted to check raise small, like that kind of range. I should have some things like this and some overcard bluffs or whatever, and I should have some fives sometimes. Uh, but then, I mean, I guess checking is not really like that important, but it like fucks up later streets. Uh, sort of a weird spot overall. Yeah. Think about it more. But um, <clears throat> multi-way pots are kind of annoyingly difficult to balance, uh, especially if you want to balance like turn river. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, when he raises, I mean. Uh, like, even if he has an overpair, I've got outs. So what about the turn? You decide to call, you're getting a decent price, even though you're out of position. Um, like you said, you have two overs, backdoor flush draw. It's unlikely that Sam, that Sam has a monster hand, so your your outs are probably good. And uh, on the turn, we check, he checks behind. What's going through your head at that point? Uh, 
Well, it seemed like I likely had the best hand after he checked behind on the turn. I mean, I guess he could have like eights full or sevens full or some weird full house. Um, but most of the time, no. Hey, Mike, I mean, what honestly is Jungle Man's plan here? You can think a guy is bluffing. Are you prepared to call him for the 12,000 you have left in your stack right now? Well, he's made the nut plus draw on the turn. I think I decided to bluff on the river. So you oh, feel like when he checks behind, he just has air, like Jack-10 suited types of hands that he raised on the flop trying to win? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, well, clearly that, that, that's easy to say that now because that's what happened. He just had air and just <laughs> decided to not to shut down. So to keep, keep leading and maybe he's, like, worried I have, like, five, six suited or... Or two or, tens. Uh, maybe, maybe he thinks I can have nine, six suited. Uh, maybe he thinks I have eight, nine or something. and He's got to, like, run a huge bluff or something like that. What about um, two tens? Does your range look like two tens, two nines, two jacks, something like those mid pairs in there where you lead call the flop? Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure it does. I mean, he also, if he thinks I can have that, he also should think I have eights, which is rare, but still. Um, yeah, I'm surprised. I'm a little bit surprised he decided to shut down here instead of, like, try to run, like, some massive bluff on me. Yeah, but, it uh, seems like raising the flop without a plan on the turn of the river makes it too likely to show a profit here by raising because it's so likely that you're going to call the flop just to see what happens. Yeah, that is kind of true. Maybe he should pick a better hand to raise with if he's going to shut down on even... On, I mean, I don't know what turn he's looking for, really. Maybe he wants a blank. Blank yeah. in some ways is better, I guess. Uh, At yeah, least have some like, backdoor equity, like King Jack of Diamonds would be so much better because he could barrel so much more effectively on diamond turns. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer King Jack of Diamonds for sure. Uh, maybe maybe he was thinking he's gonna barrel on some air, and maybe he thinks like I can have like gut shots and like six four suited in my range or something like that. Which I mean, I mean maybe uh, like if they like min raise pre it, probably call it. I mean depends on large the size of pre flop, but you know six four suited versus a cold call on the cutoff and Eugene opening. I mean. Uh, I don't see this yeah. hand like going yeah. particularly great. <laughs> yeah, for sure. How strong a call was that by Jungle Man on the flop? Well, can he stand another bet? That's the question. Nine comes off on the river. So virtually there's no hand Jungle Man can beat but a complete stone bluff here. So what about on the river? Um, the pot's about 10,000 now and it completes a one card straight so complicates a lot of things. Definitely ranges change a lot on the river um, when yeah. this card rolls off. Walk me through some of your betting strategy here. Why did you decide to turn your hand into a bluff? Uh, you know what? I'm not real thrilled with this. Maybe I thought he could have like a pair of eights or something like that and fold. Uh, yeah, I played way differently. I, I might not have bluffed there now in retrospect just because uh, it kind of looks like... I mean, it's kind of hard to put me on a hand. It's not, it's not that bad of a bluff because I guess in theory I could have like uh, like a boat or something like that. Like that would make sense um, to lead to bet on the river, especially if he thinks like, oh, like jungles like can't really have it or something like that. Uh, it, it seems like uh, I was just thinking I didn't have much showdown value, um, which might be true. But uh, I mean, clearly I beat some hands like Jack and King Jack and Queen Jack and stuff like that. Isn't there something so, to be said about betting because this is the essentially the bottom of your range? This is one of the worst hands you could have, and so betting here from a game theory standpoint might be a good idea because there essentially are no bluffs in your range. Um, well, that's, that's not that's not always true, and uh, I mean, it's, I can think of some other hands I can have here too. If I could have this, I could have Ace Ten of Diamonds. Yeah, and it's like that. I'd rather have Ace Ten of Diamonds, I think, because it blocks his if him, him if he has like Jack Ten. Like, I'd rather do it with that hand than I think this hand. Uh, also, you have more showdown value with Ace-Queen. But the, also another problem is that I don't really have that many value bets either. I can have full houses, I can have some weird sixes, and I can have like a five. Maybe yeah, seven, six, a seven, six suited? Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe they can fit over pairs too. It really doesn't look like he has a six, frankly. Um, bidding an over pair would be pretty ambitious, though. Right. Uh, an overpair seems like it's good here really often. If I had like jacks or something, uh, it, it seems like an okay bet uh, because it does seem like at, it, at first I thought I didn't have that many value bets, but um, I could have some a lot. 
especially after he checks back the turn. Right. Um, I mean, and yeah, I don't. It seems like I can't have that many bluffs, but he could just say if Jungle Man has overcards here. It seems like it's pretty easy to have overcards in a spot like this. So, uh, what's your bet sizing point. strategy here? Is that why you bet half the pot because you kind of wanted it to make like it look like you could be value betting more hands than you actually had? Uh, maybe that was what I was thinking. Maybe I was trying to pretend like I had an overpair or something. Half pot seems okay. I mean, if you bet an overpair, you can't bet like that big. Yeah, you can't really jam here. Otherwise, you're essentially repping a boat or nothing. Yeah, jamming is ridiculous. Right. Uh, uh, if, you, if I jammed, I want to pick like something very specific for a couple reasons. Uh, one is psychological, and uh, just so I wouldn't like. Like, if I pick something that's better to bluff with, it's like hard to give up and tell, in my opinion. Uh, and also because, from a game theory standpoint, there are certain hands that are better to jam with than others. Like, I prefer to have the ten of diamonds in that case. Like, ace ten with the with the ten of diamonds is like a way better hand to jam with, or. Uh, or queen jack, maybe even. If I, for some reason, had like queen jack a diamond. That'd be that would be something. <laughs> it would be pretty special to wind up with that one. He may think he has to bluff at the pot to win it. He might put Sam on a pair of sevens now. Maybe a pair of eights. Wonder if a bet would get him off his hand. He's got just over a pot bet back. About about twelve thousand in his stack, Mike, and ten thousand in the pot. <laughs> I didn't have a pair. Nice one. And... So I thought it was some stupid work. <laughs> he went all in there, did he? And, and well, Trickett pulled his hand, is that what happened? He went to bet his hand and Sam Trickett mucked his hand. He might have thought he was stealing the pot, he actually had the best hand, but... Wow. Pretty interesting stuff, as you said. To call a re-raise on the flop with just a queen. Well, that's yeah. awesome, man. Well, thank you for your insight. I think that's good here for 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 this hand specifically. One like sort of follow-up question with this is: Did you change your like online game a lot? Like you mentioned, um, you know how different it was in the past, like four or five years ago, how you changed the way you play and how you would play this hand differently today than in the past. What what sort of changed in the past for your online game since then? Um. Well, like I said, I played tighter pre-flop. Uh, my ranges are more like, or, or less like call and try to outplay my opponent type of thing, or or more like call and my ranges can't be beat kind of thing. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, usually, usually, but not always, that's my approach to pre-flop. Uh, and is that because the game has changed so much? I, if I notice I can open up, I, I will open up, but... Is that because the other players play so much tighter in general and other players are playing more fitter fold? So to adjust to them, you have to play more fitter fold in order to be ahead of their ranges from a math standpoint? Um, it depends. More like if they're playing ranges that are that are mathematically correct and uh, if they're playing ranges that are mathematically correct, usually it's, it's, it's less of a headache to try to like level them and to try to just like, uh, it's easier to level someone post-flop because it's much easier to have holes post-flop, but pre-flop, it, it's like far easier to play in such a way that you can't really like beat their strategy. Uh, so um, pre-flop, I just try to like ignore that problem. If someone's playing reasonably competent, it isn't having like ob obvious, uh, doesn't have obvious uh, leaks, so I just try to play what I think's like solid pre-flop. Yeah, I like I like that idea, especially because it seems like the game has moved more towards a game theory approach. Like so many more players are playing so much more efficiently, if you will. There's so many less leaks in their game, so you really can't exploit them by playing 25, 30 percent of your hands preflop like you used to be able to yeah. five years ago. Yeah, yeah, that does not work anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So it's real, a... real quick before we wrap up, what are your WSOP plans or EPT Monaco? What's like coming up for you in the, the schedule for the next two months? Uh, I'll probably play both of them. Um, for WSOP, it's always so tempting because there's so much going on and there's so many things that I, I usually want to play. Uh, but um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to play tournaments or cash games for WSOP. I mean, I've historically played cash games, but I might just play some tournaments. That's the classic uh, dilemma, right? You always go there with these intentions of playing cash games, and then you wake up one day and there's the 25K, and you're like so tempted to go chase the 
chase it. At least for me, I totally understand that uh, that like inner dilemma. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, well, now I play play mixed games, so like sometimes good mixed games run and things like that and Bobby's room and definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, that should be fun. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you out there. I know we played uh, one of the last the uh, 50k or something last summer, so hopefully I catch you there, and uh, hopefully I'll be on your left. But uh, I'll see you out in the summer. All right. See ya. Thanks for your time. Cheers, man. See ya.